Welcome to the Total Bitcoin podcast show. Really excited. Knut Swanholm and Giacomo Zucco, thank you so much for your time, guys, for coming on my show. And um, let's, yeah, let's get it rolling. Um, how are you guys doing? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Doing good. Fine, all considering, all things considering. Considering all the circumstances. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just uh, put the link on Twitter so people can follow that and we're ready to go. Okay, um, now let me, let me start off um, by saying that um, I want to start off with, uh, yeah, with, the, with, the, uh, with this coronavirus COVID-19 thing. Um, can I ask you without being crucified as a conspiracy theorist, um, is, I mean, how, how credible is this, is the testing procedure for COVID-19? I mean, because I haven't really, uh, found an expert who could explain to me what is really in detail, uh, like the procedure, what, what is the procedure of the COVID-19? Uh, it, uh, because I wouldn't be surprised if I had sort of a mild or severe flu, that the test would still show positive. Well, so I, I don't know, Knut, if you have more uh, insight into this. I will. Uh, I, I can start because I don't know very much. Most of the criticism I, I uh, used, uh, most of the critical sense I decided to use in this situation was based mostly on logic and, and basic statistics and not in deep knowledge about this testing. What I know, which may not be correct, so don't, don't assume I am correct about this, the idea that I got about testing is that there are at least two main uh, testing, uh, let's say, uh, templates. The first one was actually from China, and it was uh, one with uh, a, a severe uh, false positive uh, tendency. So it could be a little bit like you say, that it could like overestimate uh, uh, positive case. While the second kind, which is mostly used by, uh, by nation states right now that I know of, is the German kind from, Ber kind from Berlin, is still a reverse polymerase uh, chain reaction. So basically, you take the, the, the idea is that you take the protein and from the protein and amino acid, you go back to the original RNA chain. And so you can insulate some genes that recognize the virus. And in theory, the, I... I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but you could, I, th I think, if you are, I'm assuming if they are not completely retarded, they are insulating some pr proteins that can get back to some RNA uh, chain, uh, a fragment of chain, which is typical of the novel coronavirus virus, and so probably not reacting to other kinds. So I would expect a positive, uh, a positive, uh, um, a false positive rate, not very, very high, what I know is that this new test has a, a false negative rate. So sometimes you test one guy once, twice, three times, and he's negative, and then the third time he is positive. And uh, of course, uh, you also don't count uh, all the, the people that you are not testing, and you don't have to be an expert on testing to understand that if you test everybody around the world, you get maybe, I don't know, let's say uh, um, a mortality of one uh, percent if you test people only inside hospitals then you will have no asymptomatics because asymptomatics don't go to hospitals and you will have a death rate of two percent and if you test everybody inside the icu intensive, intensive care then you will probably have mortality of 20 percent and then if you test the people inside the morgue uh, then you will have mortality of 100 percent so the problem of testing is not really the test itself but where it gets done and for example in italy it's mostly done only inside hospitals. And so the problem is that, of course, the selection bias be becomes huge. But, this, but in theory, to answer your question directly, I think that the current test is basically uh, like 70% of accuracy. So it should uh, underestimate the positivity. Of course, it also underestimates because it's, a, it's based on a protein present in the blood. So if you already fought off and won against the virus, you, you had it, but you don't have the positivity to that because you don't have the protein around anymore. So in that case, you need actually a check on the, on the antigen, uh, basically the antibodies, uh, and the, which is a completely different test 
that very few people are doing right now. And that would also be useful in order to understand, especially, I mean, I, I again, I'm not an expert, but if I was to uh, gun to my head to decide what to do to test, I would say blood donors with all the blood frozen with different age of donors, like uh, in, in January, in uh, December, in November. And I will test uh, antibodies in those, uh, uh, in those bags of blood so we can understand exactly where the virus was and, and where it went and how long was it, was it around because I am completely unconvinced about and another bias. One bias I told you about is the selection bias of the, the severity of symptoms. So the more you move towards the morgue, the more severe the symptoms will be. But the other selection bias is, for example, there was this guy in Italy that was considered the, the patient zero uh, because uh, his wife told somebody that he was in contact uh, with a guy from Wuhan. But then this story was proven false. So this guy was tested and he was positive, but he was assumed to be the first guy spreading the, the contagion. So everybody was tested only if they were in contact with this guy. And so they, they built a beautiful uh, chain of spreading, which was based, was, was just confirming a, 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 a priori assumption uh, about that guy being the first one. So, um, so I, I don't think the problem is really, I hope the problem is not really that this test is not, is just uh, randomly testing generic coronavirus. I hope that this test is uh, testing this novel coronavirus, but I don't have the competence to, to, to confirm you that. Okay, um, let me, okay, uh, and another question. Do you think, uh, because there came reports out that, um, uh, I mean, you, you can, if you, when we listen to the mainstream news now, the narrative has changed, sort of, it's not that people have died from, but because, but you are, I don't know what's the formulation, it's like, they, they express it differently, say like, uh, uh, because we of are, the, yeah, because of the yeah, testing yeah. or after the testing, uh, people have died, so there is, I don't know how many, like how, how much statistical error and, and errors and, and uh, intentionally or negligently, like they put people into comorb uh, comorbidity uh, statistics. So they yeah. haven't actually died from the virus, but or, 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 or caused by the virus. Sorry, but, Knut, I am, I'm talking too much. I will leave you to talk, Knut. But no anyway, the, the, point, <laughs> the point here is that there, there is this kind of underestimation of, uh, oh, sorry, overestimation of people died for this virus because everybody positive that was dead for any kind of reason, including uh, terminal, like, uh, terminal stage cancer, was included initially in the statistics. I remember in uh, Worldometer statistic, there was a moment in which an, a, a quarantine center in China collapsed, killing in the, in, the, in the structural building collapse, it killed like seven people, all positive. And so the number went up to seven. Uh, so initially it was like this. I think that now it's, complete, it's, it's even worse because it's dishomogeneous. Some countries are trying to limit the number to the number which are clinically, uh, this, um, I mean, uh, but, but it's also, I mean, it's very difficult to decide because uh, maybe you are terminally ill, but you will not die now. You will die in three months mm -hmm. if you don't have that, and that can deteriorate. So it's very, it's a, it's a slippery slope. I don't think that the, uh, this kind of underestimation is that important. It's true that most of these people is not dying for coronavirus, but is dying with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that most of the, m many people dying for coronavirus are not recorded because they are not tested. So I think we have probably an overestimation because of that and an underestimation because of the untested people. I think that globally they, the, the number of people dead for this could not be so off and so, and so different from that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think we're talking like five, 10% mm -hmm. margin there, something like that. I agree with everything Giacomo said. What I know about the, uh, the tests for after you've had the disease, uh, like the antigen tests, or what did you call them, Giacomo? Uh, yeah, that they, antibodies, yeah. Yeah, that, that they are more unreliable than the actual when you have the disease tests. And uh, f for this reason, our, uh, our equivalent of the NHS in Sweden, are uh, they aren't testing very many subjects. And I, I, I think that's the, the, the funny thing about just about you and me hooking up here uh, talking about 
Corona Guillermo, is that we come from opposite countries when it comes to how we tackle Corona, right? right. And uh, and you have a severe crisis. We have a light crisis, or like we're in the 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 first phases of this thing, and you're in like a, a, one of the top, one of the worst places to be in right now when it comes to Corona, right? Even though the U.S. has passed you, but uh, I think. Uh, what our our government has done, we we sort of we're a, a close case in in Europe in the sense that we we have still have quite laissez-faire rules, and I don't think that this is due to like a, an urge for liberty or like competence on behalf of the government, but it's more like pure luck and a lack of a will to act. We have a, a lazy government that doesn't act on stuff. Right now, I'm happy to be in Sweden be, because of exactly this, because I don't like being governed, as you all know. And, as we, <laughs> and I think uh, since Sweden is such a, uh, a country, we, we have like most single households in the world like people don't live with their families because they depend on the state too much so we all live lonely up in the north we we stand like 20 meters from each other in the queue to the bus and we don't sit next to each other in public transportation if we can avoid it we don't talk to each other that much i mean italy is the total opposite where you yeah. you even talk with your hands right and you you're around your market squares are 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 the filled with people normally every day and we're like the opposite of that so for us it's like basically back to back to what we were when when we were sort of sort of in the east block more than the west block if, if you know what i mean i remember my it, it sort of reminds me of my childhood this thing when with a less liberalized liberalized sweden or whatever you may call it but i think it's very fascinating that that uh, our socialist leaning government uh is is one of the more you know allowing governments in europe right now and uh, even our uh, closest neighbors uh, denmark and norway they've taken very draconic measures on this and they're they're locking down their countries totally and i think they have a a more uh they're more unified in a way but in Sweden, I think we more tend to we tend to trust institutions and governments to a very large degree. So if they say that we recommend that you do this and this, we recommend that you stay home, people will do that, uh, not because of a threat of violence, because but because we're very um, how shall I put it uh, <laughs> prone to follow orders or follow recommendations we all listen to the government too much i believe but this is the outcome right now and i'm kind of happy with it since it since it doesn't clip my wings too much yeah it's very interesting i'm not completely both on the soul sorry on the uh, idea of a different timing because i think that, that that's, that's a current narrative but i'm not 100 percent sure that's no, uh, about uh, the virus arriving here before and then there. I mean, we don't know because what we are, I mean, people looking at number right now, they are looking at number of tests. If you plot the number of positive cases and, and that people against the number of tests, basically you see that the numbers are following the tests. And when you have plateau, most of the time is because the, the number of tests per day is at plateau. So I'm a little bit skeptical about the timing definition, but that's the actual narrative. But everybody has, uh, you're, you're right, Knut, we, are the, the, we are in the places which are the opposite. Like uh, Sweden is the only place in Europe basically where the lockdown is not really enforced, but just like proposed. And Italy is the place in Europe with the worst kind of uh, lockdown uh, regulation because right here, uh, unlike in uh, France, you cannot go alone with a mask in a, in a park. You cannot bring your child in a stroller with a mask alone. You cannot do basically anything unless very stupid things like stay in a, in a row for the supermarket with 100 other people. That's that you can. Or uh, like uh, or go to smoke to buy. To, uh, so there was a guy that was basically criminally charged two days ago or three days ago because he went to buy food at the supermarket and he bought one bag of pasta and three bottles of wine. And so the cop decided that it was too much wine versus pasta ration, so he was criminally charged. 
because it was yeah, really because it was it's non so non essential really? yeah. expenses. That's really. this is what yeah. Italy has boiled down is to. It, in yeah. the 20, uh, it's incredible, right? And right, yeah. uh, uh, but another thing here, which is very interesting, is that you will say uh, they are more in a, in a way they are less tyrannical because the population is more obedient, so you need less tyranny, which is very interesting because mm -hmm. in Italy, everybody is very, very statist, but they're not very, very obedient. So yeah, in Italy, there is this, there is like a double approach to the state. The state is publicly always the friend, so if I have to speak, the state is always good. We have to trust the state, we have to obey the state, and if you yeah. don't, I will, I will, I will, uh, I will basically, uh, I will denounce you because you should, but then privately, everybody is in complete distrust it's, of it's the state. The so there is here. It, it's, it's, the, it's the literal opposite here. B because we're allowed, everybody talks shit about the government all the time in the workplaces. But when, it, when push comes to shove, we're, we're obedient. And I don't know what is more frightening, uh, really, when, when confronted with it like this. Like, uh, I think our, our system is also corrupt, but people don't see the corruption the same way. And maybe it's a bit less corrupt than Italy, <laughs> but, but it's, still, it's still not a system I trust. And I would like, and there are some limits to what you can say and what you can think that are really scary. Like there are some, uh, some areas where you just don't go in public conversation here, which is like, the. the there was a Brit that once said about Swedes that it's not that they don't change their minds. It's just that they do it all uh, at the same time, like a school of fish. <laughs> so with the immigration, for instance, we had that, uh, uh, the, the, the large numbers in 2015. And all of a sudden, when the biggest party, the, the Social Democrats thought it was okay to say that, talk about numbers, it was okay to talk about numbers. And then the school of fish went the other way. And so I don't, I don't really want to know what to think about it. And uh, I don't know what is scary, uh, what the scariest scenario is here. Uh, I find it really disturbing that we're so obedient, but then on a personal level, I like not having laws governing me, but recommendations instead. It's an interesting yeah. trade off. Probably the other, I mean, if you plot everything on a square, yeah. I mean, we have like, we are the opposite and the other opposite may be like uh, Texas and China because in Texas, they talk shit about the government and they don't uh, obey the government. They should, yeah. if, they, if they must. And in China, they, they don't talk shit about the government because yeah, they're or, very nationalistic. And also they yeah, don't- Yeah, or Cuba. I, I went to Cuba. Oh. I saw, saw in a kindergarten, uh, there was a picture of Shea and Fidel with machine guns, with Kalashnikovs, and it said, Socialismo Muerte on, on the mural there uh, to a kindergarten. So, of course, of, like, we should plot the countries on a square, like for obedience and yeah. Uh, nice. uh, yeah. Also, it's very funny, like socialism or muerte, like you, it's an it's an opposition, but actually you usually get <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> socialism y muerte. That's the correct phrase. Yeah. <laughs> now uh, let me yeah. let me show you this picture. I mean, uh, for the podcast people, it's just uh, but it's just hilarious. Um, can you see this? <laughs> I guess yeah, yeah. I, I, I assume it's in Germany because it's in German. Or I don't think it's in Austria. <laughs> it says together, together against the virus, uh, reduce the contacts, um, um, you know, um, keep a distance and obey the, the orders. And you see like, you know, a bench, sort of a, you know, a, what do you call it? Like a bench, you know, like a metal bench where two people can yeah, sit yeah, yeah. and it's fenced around. And, I mean, how ludicrous has this become? How ludicrous has the draconian yeah, the measures become? I think the virus is actually bigger than the holes in the <laughs> fence, right? So it can get through. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so let's okay, let's let's talk because okay, let me let me tie this in with the questions because it's pretty good questions by Victor Aram. He asks, he's got a two part questions. He says, uh, great, looking forward. A question to Giacomo. Uh, we've seen you denounce the many police state surveillance tools which states are introducing to supposedly fight COVID 19. But what do we really need to fear the state as much as in the past? Let's, let's stick to the first part. 
Um, uh, yeah, well, I think they are they are connected because uh, he says uh, uh, the massive economic meltdowns currently underway is a sign of the end of the fiat system and those the clear indication of the rapidly waning powers of the nation state. Do you disagree? So I think it's all one. And I well, this is another very interesting subtle question. So this, this tonight is a very difficult podcast because usually I have to 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 speak against statism and some statists will will talk, will speak in favor of statism. And I would be right, and it would be wrong. So it's easy. Tonight we are we are being very nuanced nu- 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 about that, like like, like previously not about uh, obedience, uh, like exterior or interior obedience. And this is another case. So I think that the answer is no. Uh, I would disagree with him partially. I understand what he means, but the point is that when you're uh, let's say when you are confronted with uh, some kind of uh, feral animal, some kind of aggressive animal. Uh, or a bandit like trying to uh, trying to rob you in the street. Uh, it's not true that if he is dying or if he is losing power, he will be less dangerous and less scary. Actually, very often it's the other way around because when you are facing extinction, you uh, you do things that you you can use a level of aggressions that you, uh, that were in a, in a, in imaginable before for many reasons. Like for example, if you face an existential an existential threat then you will start to go beyond any kind of ethical barrier, any kind, not that not the nation state have any kind of ethical barrier, but even consensus barrier. Like even, even in China where you don't have election, you still need support, general support from the population. You still need populist support, if not popular support. And when you're facing extinction, you can do stuff that goes beyond that. Like a regime which is, uh, uh, which is close to, to falling down, they can actually do stuff that are too much for the population because they don't have alternative. If they are facing extinction anyway, they can exaggerate. And uh, I think that in this case, um, governments uh, with, I mean, in the context of the collapse of the fiat system, governments would be so scared to be, I think, more dangerous and than less because yes, they are, they are losing money, but they are in the final, you know, the final berserk where your body, when you are in berserk mode and your body doesn't have to think about survival anymore, only about killing the last enemy. And that's something similar. That's, that's together with the fact that uh, right now the power of the state in monetary terms, uh, thanks to the, to the fiat collapse and maybe in the future, thanks to Bitcoin as an alternative, is going down. But the power, the ideological power of the state, I think it's an all-time high since uh, since probably Nazi uh, Nazi uh, rise in in, uh, uh, in the thirties in Germany. I yeah. mean, I something like this last weeks uh, with people trusting the government completely about any not not about what to do, but about what is happening. Like uh, complete trust in institution. It is conflicted, especially in, in Italy. It's conflicted. But let me let me say that this way. It's conflicted what I am. I will do because I don't really trust the government. But one thing is sure: I will sell my neighbor to the government in order to. I mean, it's everybody against everybody. It's a war of everybody against everybody to push everybody under the bus of the government in order to be to be spared. So it's it's a very very uh, uh, ideologically speaking, statism is not uh, losing power. Is actually I think uh, uh, if not. Uh, old time I, the second second to old time I after World War Two. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we're going to see blood before before hyper Bitcoinization. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I I think it would be nasty. I'm not entirely convinced that this is the end of the fiat system, though. It could be the event that triggers the pin that pops the bubble, but I I remember thinking so. Uh, uh, during the last financial crisis as well, that it might be over then because things were really out of hand then already, right? Now they like, we have five or 10 times the problem we had back then, but I'm not, I, I'm not entirely convinced that this cannot go on forever. Or, no, I'm convinced that it cannot go on forever, but I'm not convinced that this is the actual end point. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. So, uh, there might be like negative interest rates and uh, mandatory uh, cash withdrawals uh, for for another ten years for what, all I know, and like everyone being pissed about the government but still obeying. Uh, 
I don't know, maybe they can pull this off somehow, the EU and the US and China. Maybe they can keep their populations controlled. Maybe people will look at China and uh, follow their example and like we'll have those futuristic uh, cops everywhere taking everyone's temperature for, for 10 years now and maybe we'll have a police state everywhere. I don't, I don't know what, where, where this is leading. Uh, I, I do think we should, we should study it closely and we should like keep our eyes and ears open here because anything could happen in a, any day now. I, I think all these circles are scary, like the virus is scary, the draconian measures are scary and whatever people would do to each other is scary too. So uh, it's, it's all, yeah. And we need to cooperate. People need to, people need to trust each other to a, to a, to a greater extent and not just institutions or whatever. Yeah. Another trade-off which I think is very clear because now I'm back to Italy because my family was in Italy. So I decided to my original family to stay, to stay here because my parents are here and Mir's parents are here. So we, we walked into the quarantine zone. But uh, I was in Switzerland the last three years. I was living in Switzerland. And in Switzerland there is a very, I mean, they are in lockdown as well. It's more reasonable than Italy. Like you can't go in the park alone. So it's not as Italy. Okay. But uh, you can buy wine if you want. But, uh, but uh, the thing is, is, is that the government is traditionally, uh, recently a little bit less, but traditionally it's, it's less powerful because society at small level is more powerful. So you have, uh, an, in, you have basically uh, very few, uh, very few uh, examples of the government bothering you, but a lot of examples of your neighbor bothering you, which is, it's always a trade-off. I think that overall that's better. Like it's good that your, I mean, your neighbor has skin in the game of uh, more, 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 most of the things you discuss. Like uh, if if your apartment uh, is uh, creating a bad smell or too hot or too cold, or uh, he, your your neighbor will suffer more direct externalities. So it's reasonable that they stress you out for stuff. While the government is some distant bureaucracy that usually don't have neither the information or the incentives to do things rationally, while your neighbor has the incentives and information to act at the local level. So there is, so what, what Crude said is very important. Uh, people fighting governments and fighting states, uh, they are not promoting selfishness. They are, they are methodologically individualist, but they are not like anti-social. They, the real opposite. Uh, in the only way to fight statism is to promote cooperation, to promote integration yeah. of people, to promote uh, global cooperation and, exactly. and division of labor. And, and uh, with that comes an opposition to coercion because we have two ways of interacting with each other. We can either do it violently or we can do it by our own choice. And that's the way I look at it. And a free market, a truly free market with sound money will enable us to, uh, to, to exchange stuff with each other and do stuff voluntarily with each other instead of being coerced into doing stuff like, like it is now with taxes and inflation and uh, interests that has to be paid to some bank. Uh, like this is the main thing that people will have to wrap their heads around. We have only two ways of interacting with each other. And it's violently or non-violently. And this is, so I agree totally there. The anti-statist is the most social person there is. The, 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 the total private uh, transaction between two people is the most social thing there is. This discussion may be another case where we uh, probably, um, freedom-oriented people lost the terminological battle in the last century because uh, I remember the I remember uh, Mrs. Thatcher make the other example about private and public and she was saying something very deep she was saying uh, like a grocery store a privately owned grocery store is actually very very public because uh, it's always open to serve and exchange mm -hmm. with other people you can yeah. always enter a grocery store or something like that while the, the room of a ministry that's a, that's in theory that's public, but it's a very very <laughs> private uh, yeah. uh, thing, secretive. which is completely <laughs> yeah. uh, very secretive and only allowed to certain people. You cannot enter a a, a, a room in the parliament or, or anywhere or, or let's let's think about uh, 
like uh, court uh, courts, you no. cannot enter that kind of facilities and do what you want because they are privately managed by bureaucrats or politicians. While most of the market uh, exercises, they are actually public, like uh, the, the, the things that we do when we discuss public blockchains versus private <laughs> blockchains. So that's the other, like, the other way around, right? And, uh, and the similar thing is about social and like, think about socialism. Socialism, people, people who, who want more society. Actually, socialists are the people that who want less society because they want more, they want to maximize uh, uh, basically what uh, there was like uh, Franz Oppenheimer, he was saying that, he was making the same distinction as, as Knut, uh, and he said there are basically economical means and political means. Economical means is when you exchange and political means is when you take stuff from others. So yeah. in the in the economical means, you have basically positive some games because I have something, but I need something else. You have something and you need something else. We exchange and we are not just as before. We are better off. We create the wealth because we increase our marginal utility. Like if I have, I mean, if I have one chicken, I eat it. If I have two chicken, I can only just uh, eat one. So uh, my, my marginal utility for chicken is, is flat. And if you have a bottle of wine, it's the same for you. If you have two bottles of wine, you cannot, I mean, maybe you can drink two, but it's, it's not healthy. So when we exchange, my marginal utility goes to two and your marginal utility goes to two. So in this, we, we are both better off. While in the aggression, I come to you to take your chicken not only you are, are worse, okay, you will, now you will fight. And so now you will have to, to spend a cost of fighting. So a cost of energy and recovery and like, uh, and, 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 uh, like uh, band aids after the fight. And we will have both to spend money, not on increasing our, our benefits, but in uh, basically in transferring a zero sum, tra not zero, a negative sum transfer of wealth. So yeah. Exactly. We could uh, exchange it for Corona instead. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, uh, for the record, uh, can I say that? Yeah, what are you drinking? You're drinking a Corona. <laughs> wow, this is awesome. So, Knut is one of the few that is not intimidated because I've seen only. pictures. Because I've seen pictures of supermarkets where, where all the, yeah. the beer shelves are, are pretty much empty except Corona. So, I don't know, you yeah. know how far this, this conditioning has, has gone. I'm doing my part to save this company. I'm doing my part to bail them out. <laughs> no, but the thing about the battle with, if I can just add on to that with the battle of the words, the battle of words, we're, we seem to be losing it because everyone I know seems to think that the US is the prime example of a free market economy we have mm -hmm. in the world, which is totally, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they fooled everyone. Because it's not really a free market economy; it's a socialist economy because of the brr, the the printing of uh, the sound of the printing press uh, is, which is keeping everyone shackled to uh, whatever. That that's just a hidden tax. I mean, even Milton Friedman said that in the seventies, and mm -hmm. people before him. Uh, uh, and th this is this is the battle we're losing. We're losing the narrative, but. Uh, the battle of narratives and they, they, they like the so-called liberals in the u.s they and the democrats uh, they they call ayn rand's writings uh, old ideas and like people are stuck in the economists like uh, like what's he called oh i'm confusing it with peter schiff but the nobel prize uh, winner Krugman. the really annoying one yeah, Krugman. Krugman. <laughs> he was on national Swedish television the other way, uh, the other day, and he was talking about these these ideas being old and boxed in and stuff like that. And we've tried that, and it didn't work. But the thing is, we haven't really tried it. Uh, he's a puppet, and they all are. And they don't listen to the box talking to you, lying to you. It's just like. That Zappa song, if you heard it, uh, I'm the Slime. If you haven't heard it, look up Frank Zappa, I'm the Slime, about, uh, about television. I will. I will. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, let me go back to my question, because, uh, uh, Giacomo, I mean, don't, don't you think this is the time now to, uh, that people, uh, let's say, a, a critical portion of the total society 
could be waking up and questioning the really fundamental legitimacy question of of the legitimacy of of the government of the nation state and of every you know centralized structure there's out there uh i mean do you think it's going into different directions uh uh cuz uh, i just read today uh saxon you know part of germany they now want people who refuse uh or object to the uh, current uh, quarantine to be to be put um uh, locked up in a psychiatry <laughs> yeah so that was that would have been my hope just if you ask me this question just one month ago but at this point i have to sadly admit that i think it's it's unlikely that uh, that this is the beginning of some kind of awakening because my hope was government is going absolutely berserk is going absolutely crazy they are trying to do everything they were never allowed to do and uh, people will react somehow and what i'm seeing is that people is not reacting are not reacting at all basically and maybe uh, it's just maybe it's just a not yet problem so maybe it will happen later so maybe i'm wrong i hope to be wrong but if i'm right the problem here is that the culture was destroyed way more i mean it was not just government versus society it was government the propaganda destroying the base of society for so long that the culture itself is completely broken and so people the people are ready to fight but they don't really have the, the slightest idea about what they want to fight for or or against like people like most of the people i know they were like in in the first world they were basically bored and 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 like they wanted an apocalypse because they they want to give meaning to their lives so they were expecting an apocalypse and if it's not the virus is the climate change it's not climate change it's something else but they want to to be part of something uh they, they are they are scared but they are, they also feel glorious in doing something inside the collective so there is there is i, I don't see a lot of if there is people re, uh, revolting they are not exactly revolting against uh, the problem they are revolting about uh, something completely arbitrary it's like after 2008 you have seen some part of the people under uh, like red pilled about the, the the fiat system and some other part of the people angry but still clueless like occupy occupy wall street so they were seeing that something was wrong but they were completely clueless about what and now it's like kind of everybody is more like occupy wall street in this uh, in this uh, coronavirus uh, crisis like uh, everybody is like uh, uh, occupy healthcare uh, they, they they don't think that the government is the problem they think that the problem is uh, people running in the parks or uh, or chinese people versus european people or or uh, or eating uh, animals or i mean they're completely randomly searching yeah, for yeah. some scapegoat yeah over here it's the right wingers that want to uh, take more draconic uh, draconic measures uh, and like to lock, they they want more of a lockdown especially uh, what they call the far right i wouldn't call it the far right i would call them socialists but anyway the uh, the sweden democrats the anti immigrant party uh, they they want they want a complete lockdown and more of a police state so so it's very it's very weird because it's all tossed around and like the words don't mean anything anymore. It seems like there is no there is no such thing as uh, like liberal used to mean whatever Adam Smith cooked up in the first place. Like uh, <laughs> liberal used to mean li leave each other alone. Liberal was equivalent with libertarian. Libertarian now is more like but the words are all mixed up and uh, nothing makes sense anymore and i don't I, I i i believe people don't really know what the different parties think because the parties themselves don't even know what they think they just play they're just there for their careers anyway all the politicians so i don't really know that's inter interesting if if uh, compare with the uh, like you know the citadel meme because uh, you know, when when I started, th this is something I shared already a few days ago with uh, with uh, uh, ugly uh, old ugly goat and 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 uh, Juan. The, the, when I was reading Ayn Rand and uh, Atlas Shrugged, I yeah. remember having uh, a some kind of disappointment about the ending because I'm not spoiling. 
but the ending was like free-minded people insulating themselves from society, one cor from corrupt the collapse in society. And I was uh, back then when I was reading Ayn Rand, I was also reading the the, the sovereign individual. And the sovereign individual is the opposite, actually. He's not insulating. He's going around the world. He's, he's checking out different governments. He's making arbitrage. He's connecting. He's exchanging. He's globalizing. While, uh, the, while the, the, the Galtian hero is insulating, which uh, is it's economically inefficient. So I was a, a little bit uh, uh, skeptical about this image of, of John Galtian. While when, right now, with this consideration about the society, I understand more uh, this kind of first, first kind of approach because it's a little bit like probably somebody could have felt at the end of the Roman Empire when it's not just the government falling down. The, the, Roman, the Roman Empire was falling down, but the Roman Empire, which inf with inflation especially, managed to corrupt the society completely. And so every social structure was falling down. A reason, science, logic, everything together. And so there was not just the government to, to take down. Everything was collapsing. And so some people started to insulate in what uh, basically what then was the monastic movement. So more like citadel theme. Yeah, I've heard that the Roman Empire, there was, there was no, like from, to my knowledge, there was no specific date when it collapsed because people in, in uh, like small groups across Europe still believe that the Roman Empire was a thing mm -hmm. for hundreds and hundreds of years after it, after it basically stopped functioning, yeah. which is so interesting because that's, that is what I believe will happen with the, our current system. It will live on and live on and live on. Uh, and we freedom seekers, we will seek other ways, better ways, build citadels, play lightning poker, whatever we, whatever we do, and uh, put, put brr memes on the internet, and uh, we will live different lives than, than the rest of the flocks. And, and they will sooner or later envy us, uh, and more and more people will move to jurisdictions where you're more allowed to, to live your life as you want to, just as in the sovereign individual. I'm half, halfway through the book uh, right yeah. now. Uh, and uh, uh, but there will be no there will be no specific point in time when all right it has collapsed the collapse doesn't doesn't happen suddenly it happens gradually even even though from a personal perspective an objective point of view you might see it as a a very specific moment in time but i don't think it will play out like yeah, that i'm not entirely sure I, I tend to agree the system will collapse but then the system reproduced itself like a virus inside the head of most of the people so yeah. even even if the, the central control of the system will go down the corrupt culture of the system will still live on for maybe maybe this will be faster than than roman empire i mean it would be it would be everything is faster now because we, we have a different scale so maybe for for years and not for centuries, yeah. hopefully. Maybe I'm stepping on some Italian toes here, Giacomo, but uh, I believe this is what has happened to the to the Catholic Church. <laughs> like many of the ideas, if not most of them, or even all of them, have been debunked somehow. But they, the meme lives on. Well, yeah, I, a, I, I kind of disagree about uh, about that. Uh, I don't know yeah, yeah. about the Italian because I'm also, <laughs> I'm also Swiss citizen, so maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the thing is, I, I view uh, religion as the predecessor to, to the nation state because it's a culture meme that is big enough for flocks to follow. And like, I believe we will have a, a there might be a third stage, something else than the nation state, which is not Bitcoin, by the way, but something else. I, I'm not sure, though. Uh, it's, it's very hard to predict the future. But you mean dogmatic as a ideas. You mean, uh, you mean as a transition? To I, I don't know. Uh, Bitcoinization? Or? We, we, could, we are seeing, not, not like the EU is like the follow up to the nation state. And the U.S. like we had we had religions and religious leaders uh, grouping people together in parts of the world, and then after that came the nation state or the city state, and then the nation state, and after that the super state, the U.S. or the Soviet Union or the EU, which are basically the same thing. They just 
entities that are obviously too large to sustain themselves for longer periods of time. Uh, and uh, these are all intersubjective hallucinations we have. They're not real. Like this table is real. This bottle of Corona is real. My opinions are mine and they are subjective. But money, nation states, religions, and whatever whatever else we believe collectively to be th true, like the English language, for instance, we all use that because we all believe it to mean, we believe that the words that come out of our mouths are representing something to the other person. But we cannot actually 100% know that <laughs> what I'm saying makes any sense now. It, it's <laughs> It sounds a bit gibberishy saying this, but, and <laughs> a bit hi hippie, like flower powery, but I, I think there's a distinction between the subjective, the objective, and the intersubjective reality. And the intersubjective re reality plane is the really dangerous part. And I I write about this in my, uh, in my new book, which is coming out uh, mm very soon now uh, uh, and uh, about how this is humanity's uh, I know you Yuval Nuval Harari has talked about this as well I don't really I'm not really a fan of him but he's got some interesting ideas about that our ability to lie to ourselves at scale are our biggest uh, advantage uh, uh, at the same time as it is our biggest shortcoming because it has made us uh, able to subdue all other life forms and conquer every continent and like make us the dominant species of the world, but at the expense of the individual's freedoms, because we're, we're locked in our minds, uh, in these mindsets that, that all these ideas uh, that made it, make us go to war or make us pay taxes or whatever it is, uh, that they are somehow real and they're no more real than a, a dream I have at night or uh, like something I think of when I jog. I mean, uh, the intersubjective ideas are very fascinating to me because people people tend to view them as absolute truths. And I, I think there's a clear distinction between what's uh, what's an inter what an intersubjective fantasy is because uh, and what is not because in hindsight you can always see that the idea was ri ridiculous like no one believes in Zeus or Thor anymore and uh, no one believes that garroting was a humane way of executing people and like we evolve like that memes evolve but there's there's an interesting thought I, I don't really know where I'm going with this or where I started but anyway <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Next the, question, please. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I agree absolutely with 99% uh, of what you said, actually. Um, uh, the, the mimetic part is, uh, the, the state is, is not just the configuration of military power. It is actually a, a, a meme that, uh, that uh, was created. Uh, it's also a very recent meme, like absolute, absolute power to the state is very recent. It's something starting from uh, Machiavelli in the, in the late, uh, in the basically started uh, in the absolute absolutist mo movement in the late uh, 16th century, and then it, it became stronger with the French French Revolu Revolution uh, because there was a, a very nice idea in the French Revolution that was uh, is not the king anymore; it's you in power. Yep. So the, the the group is not representing it's himself or God; it's representing you. So how can you react? against you i mean it's just you hurting you so be peaceful and accept it and then there was the world war one that was the other incredible increase together with this, the, the the beginning of uh, of extreme uh, fractional reserve confiscation of gold and basically the, the beginning of the fiat, fiat system and then the apotheosis of statism in the in the 20th century and apparently it's not ended yet. So I agree. The, the only point, point in which I don't uh, explicitly agree, which is also the only point of uh, Knut's uh, book that I, well, actually only the introduction to Knut's book that, I, that I'm not sure I agree with, is that is the conception, the conception of religion. Uh, Knut's uh, conception of religion as something similar to the nation state is not anything, I mean, surprising. Uh, it's, it's completely, uh, I mean, it's very mainstream in a way, but uh, I, I tend to give more weight to the argument that makes uh, religion as a 
possible opposing force to the nation state meme in the at least not, not right now if i have to be honest like right now like uh, Bergoglio is, is a socialist puppet, but uh, traditionally I can see the Catholic Church and in some cases even the, the Orthodox Church as uh, forces of opposition to uh, the religion in general, especially Christianity in the West, as an opposition to the government. And, and I could go further, there are some representation of the nation state's idea that see the nation state as a, uh, as a, um, the, um, like a competing religion competing against Christianity to become the prevalent religion of the West. They are copying basically the rituals, the, 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 the meme instead of God. If you think about now, like in the, the, the new progressive movement, you have, the, your, you have your original sins, which is being a human being destroying the nature. You have your sins yeah, it's, like... Uh, like I, I West, agree West totally West. that it's, a, it's just another religion to me. But I think we're coming from... I, I, I do see that the, uh, the religious institutions, uh, the, the religions could be an opposing force to the political institutions. And I think this has its basis back in when, when secularism started and when states became secular, because then they sort of became opposing forces. Before that, they were the same thing, right? Yeah. Back in Galileo's time, there was no difference between the Catholic Church and the state in Italy, for instance. Well, no, I, I mean, it's, it's not entirely true. Like, the, the, the power, the military power in Galileo's time is, was very, very decentralized. While the, the uh, let's say, the intellectual authority was very centralized under Rome. But uh, if you were not in Rome under the, the Pontifician state, you, uh, so uh, Galileo is probably a little bit late because it's almost already in the absolute state. But if you go back to high Middle Ages, like in, uh, in the 13th century, what you will see would be a man, where, where the, uh, around the man you have basically a feudatory castle with the, his uh, feudal relationship, then a monast monastery where the monk is basically the boss and he is the boss even against the bishop. And then you have the, the bishop with, yeah, yeah. The, with, the, uh, with the secular church. And then you have the free city state. And then you have the Templar Knights, the religious order, but they are non-territorial. Then you have a Lex Mercatoria of the merchant, which is an independent law system by the merchants. And then you have basically all of this interacting in a very polycentric way. And religion was basically a strong part of that, but not really uh, a monolithic part. It was very, it was probably more distributed. Yeah. Uh, of course, I think that that has a little bit to do that from the fact that Christianity then was was becoming uh, very powerful and very monopolistic, especially during his his apex. But it was starting as a persecuted and pro forbidden religion. So the the beginning of Christianity, like if it's very interesting to say to to read, for example, Saint Augustine, because it's like. When they were uh, under persecution, they were all about uh, freedom of expression because they were under persecution. And then yeah. when they started to, uh, to get in power with Constantine, they started to persecute. And so you can see some kind yeah. of, uh, at least an, an inner uh, a conflict inside Christianity, I think, between, be between monopolism and, and, uh, and pluralism. Yeah. I'm happy to tell you, Giacomo, in the... In the uh, disclaimer that like the first part of my new book there's something about that we cannot know uh, uh we're, we're all chained to the arrow of time right so we cannot know if the ideas of the enlightenment are came to be because of a well-organized judeo-christian society or if the religious ideas just held us back you cannot know which one is true because history played out in the way it did so so the thing is but i i draw a clear distinction between uh, uh religion and faith i think they are two separate things i think faith is a personal thing and everyone is entitled to their own whatever faith they want to whatever they want to believe that is fi totally fine with me but i find organized religion to be very a very disturbing thing just as i find the state to be a very disturbing thing i mean like large entities in in general are scary because there there is bound to be a, a an amount of coercion going on in organizations that are larger than dunbar's number like you can you cannot you cannot organize people 
if if there's not a a a sort of violent meme in the background scaring people that if they don't follow this uh, like this is in my first book like uh, about burial grounds and ceremonial burial this is when uh, nations started to expand and when city states became larger is when they invented the lie that there is a, a uh, regardless of if if it's true or not they could tell their 18 year olds to go out in battle because there would be a better life after this one. And if, if you can make someone believe that, you can make them kill other people. So this is uh, from, a, from an imperialist perspective, this is a very good tool to have, just as the coronavirus is a good tool for, for our evil governments to Which, have right now. If you think about that, it's a little bit like the opposite. Like a coronavirus is perfect also for secularist mindset because if there is not an afterlife, then you have to keep living what, no matter what and you, you, you must <laughs> yeah, stay yeah. home and kill everybody else because there is only... So it's interesting. Like no, no, really, not kill everybody else. You have well, to stay alive. Stay alive. And <laughs> killing everybody else exposes you to yeah, more risk right, of getting right. the disease yourself. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend that. Just you be, be reclusive, fuck off, and, off and go away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. I agree. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, uh, well, I don't know. Like, uh, it's true that in order to scale an idea above the number numbers, you need powerful idea. I'm not sure you need necessarily a violent idea. The example that you made before about English language is a counter example, but we could do the, good example. Do the same with yep. a good example, right? Of a, a something, an idea, a meme that can scale be beyond number numbers, but also Bitcoin or the internet. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Gold, even without imposition. If, uh, so I think that's... Yeah, I, I, sorry if it came out wrong there, no, but no. Uh, like, uh, I, I don't mean that a violent idea is necessary. I just think that that is yeah. often the case. True. True. Yeah. Especially because I see, like, yeah, we are going a little bit off topic, but I see many religion phenomena are very, not really organized, but a little bit emergent. So I don't know, I probably have a more uh, uh, Lindy effect view of, uh, probably similar to Talib view of religions as uh, some kind of. Uh, societal expression that are probably not pathologic but that's a more personal thing i guess yeah i mm -hmm. sort of sort of agreed with talib when i read uh, uh skin in the game on religion but uh i sort of disagreed and i sort of agreed with parts of it but i think all bitcoiners should read uh hitchens dawkins uh dennett and uh and harris as well <laughs> oh, I did for a yeah. <laughs> Especially Hitchens. No, I have or to catch up listen with to some his debates. Then. Okay. <laughs> There's a long uh, list. Anyway, next question, K. But uh, we haven't yeah. let you. Uh, you're not no, no, speaking it's good. at no, all. No, there, I, I love. You. I love listening to you guys. Um, let me. Let's go. Let's zoom a little bit back because I want to. You know, uh, connect a little bit to the recent article that um, uh, Giacomo published, a treatise on Bitcoin and privacy, part two. I mean, it's a part one, two. A part one, two. Don't be misled by red herrings. Now, um, would you agree that um, both of you? I mean, uh, want to have your take? Uh, don't, I mean, would you agree we are on the precipice on something here, where? Um, I mean, sometimes I ask myself how pain resistant or how conditioned have people become in order to go into action? I mean, this is the ultimate question at the end of the day, like what, what needs to be, what needs to happen? What, what, what speed, what process needs to take place in order to make people comprehend, you know, reflect, be inspired, uh, you know, think about the cause and effect and go into action. Now, do you think we're going, we are about at least a critical mass, like building up a parallel society with, with uh, you know, independent infrastructure, technological infrastructures, more, in, more open source, more self-sovereignty by, by going into privacy tools, you know, buying Bitcoin, taking privacy into your own hands. Do you think this is, this is evolving? Uh, uh, Giacomo, maybe you want to answer first? So I think that's happening, but not really at a societal scale. It's, it's a little bit, this is a little bit of continuation, actually, of, of what we said before. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to think that we are on the verge of a massive 
uh, let's say, awakening or at least uh, rejection of the of the status meme. And I was in, I was very uh, like uh, possibilistic with the idea of this kind of awakening uh, until actually until this crisis. Now I don't I cannot rule it out completely, but I think I'm I'm slowly changing my mind versus something which is more similar to a uh, like localized I mean a, a, a niche countercultural reaction. So uh, the 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 my, my my thesis was the. The, the, the culture of liberty is niche, but the culture of slavery supported by the fiat system is collapsing. So when the fiat system will collapse, where the niche will emerge from the niche and become mainstream. While that may be true from the, from the, from the sheer uh, economic point of view, like most of the wealth of the world after the collapse of the fiat system, I think it will enter Bitcoin. That may not be uh, as true as for culture, like uh, using privacy and stuff like that. I think that most of the, I think that the, 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 new, the new paradigm is so different from the current paradigm, mainstream paradigm, that probably will, it will not just be a switch or a fast migration, but like, a, like, like the example of the Roman Empire, a slow, a slow progressive decomposition of the existing one, and the slow, not necessary explosive uh, growth of the of the new one. So the price uh, change may be explosive. So I think hyper Bitcoinization will probably happen, and it would be explosive because it's a it's a, it's an economic phenomenon where I mean a socialist can remain a socialist, but he will buy he will hate Bitcoin, but he will buy Bitcoin because he needs because there yeah. is hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. But the the battle of the ideas. I, and including the battles about privacy and and general uh, like and, and many other cultural things around Bitcoin that may be quite slower to to become mainstream. Yeah, uh, about privacy, uh, we're all sitting having this meeting uh, over Zoom now. Zoom, yeah. And did you see the value <laughs> of the Zoom company of one st uh, of the uh, the value of the Zoom company is forty two billion dollars. The value of the three biggest airlines in America, Delta, American Airlines, and uh, United, is $31 billion. And it's not because they provide us with a convenient tool. It's because they record everything. And we're being, this very conversation right now is being uploaded to a server. And we're run through an AI and a facial recognition bullshit thing that is going to bust our asses one day. And we have, us three, we have all put our asses on the line because we believe that uh, privacy is, <laughs> either we believe, either we don't know what we're doing or we believe privacy to be fucked anyway and that there's no way out and there's, we have a mobile phone so there's, uh, there's no way we can escape this. Or we believe that uh, some form of semi-celebrity will help us somehow because people will think that we know what we're talking about so at some point in the future. Uh, and But I, say, I think privacy is basically fucked uh, uh, the way it is since because of all these tools. Like, uh, that must be the main reason why so Zoom is so highly valued at the moment. It can't only be a good like Skype was doing this uh, well badly but anyway video video conferencing is not a new thing hmm. what uh, and like we are we, we are given a social security score another sweet you know Eric Wall right uh, he, he talks a lot about uh, the uh, private and he experiments with this stuff and like looks himself up in uh, uh, Russian databases and stuff and we we already have a social security score like uh, what what options you if you're a sex worker for instance and uh, the internet knows this uh, you will probably not get the same search results on Airbnb as a person that is not a sex worker and like and facial recognition plays a part in this because you can have a false name but once you upload your picture the the search filter will go on anyway and like there there are i don't really know what to do about privacy because i i just think it's a scary thing uh, uh if if we stay in bitcoin and if we actually do work in bitcoin and sell our 
like if there's an actual Bitcoin economy, which is not uh, like untouched by the other economy, by the old economy, th then then we're finally free. But the steps to get there will be hard. And like we can do as many coin joins and Mimblewimble coins and whatever they call them. <laughs> uh, uh, and we can take it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, <laughs> he keeps popping up in my head after another oh, podcast. I did where someone called him a cock but anyway <laughs> uh, uh, privacy is a difficult thing because I don't uh, like we're all we already fell into these traps with social networks we, we've all we've already been registered uh, you know just need to run the algorithm and like everyone is under control already so like the surveillance is as bad as it, it it's really bad right now like people can pinpoint anyone else's location if you have the right tools you can peep, you can guess yourself to a 99.8% uh, probability that a person will be at a specific spot in the next 3 months and with a 99.8% accuracy because people are predictable in their the the patterns they move in uh, and AI the AI tools are as good as this right now and it's really scary. So and until we get a a real Bitcoin economy going where we interact with Bitcoin among ourselves uh, amongst ourselves, uh, we sell we work only for Bitcoin. Once you go full Bitcoin, that, that's that's when you get out of that. And I'm too old for that. I I, I I'm afraid. <laughs> So I will have to live in the transition period and I don't know what to tell my kids, <laughs> really. <laughs> well, to, yeah. And yeah. To I'm a little bit schizophrenic uh, uh, in that regard too. I mean, it's a precipice because on the one hand, I'm really concerned because if this process accelerates at a speed we can't even fathom uh, with whatever mandatory vaccination and nanoparticle, uh, I don't know, tattoo, uh, you know, certificates as Bill Gates' wet dream is, um, where are we going with this? I mean, uh, you know, once this point is reached, can we reverse this process or, or, you know, can we stop it? Or that's why my question, you know, are, or do we really need urgently as ever, as like never before build up, you know, like uh, build those new infrastructures, new systems, new structures in order to make the old ones obsolete, uh, Jacob, I mean, where are we going with this? You know, what if they ban well, cash think, right now? They have the perfect arguments right now for banning cash. And let me, let me give you three possible optimistic, just to change it a bit, the, the very pessimistic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, tone. yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry about the rant. No, no, I, I, my, my <laughs> rant was pessimistic as well. I mean, I'm trying to now try to force myself to see the silver lighting. I can come up at least with three things. The first thing is basically that, yes. Uh, the, the mass culture will never switch as Bitcoiners to preemptive privacy. Like uh, Bitcoiners are trying to be preemptively conscious about what can happen after, while people in the, in the mainstream culture, they are not. They, they are completely trusting everybody until the shit is, is, is the fan eventually. And mm -hmm. only then they, they, they realize. But the interesting thing about reactive uh, privacy concerns uh, there are what people are basically thinking now is that the more the government will use the privacy, the lack of privacy to do bad things, the more people will start to react. Of course, too late. So in order to, I mean, you're already fucked, but uh, the, it's like, I don't know what to say. Uh, the, the, the world was set in a way where everybody was thinking that there was no risk in sharing everything. Now, th there was a risk, the Bitcoin culture guys, the cypherpunk guys, they were basically uh, foretelling the risk and trying to prepare in advance, which is very, very difficult. Most of the people will not follow us on this path, but most of the people will want to react after the damage is done, when they do have the feedback. So they, they are very bad at, at low time preference. They cannot plan now for a future privacy problem, but they will be able to change stuff with a lot of suffering of course with a lot of cost and destruction and suffering and many people will, will will lose a lot of stuff but then they will be more uh they will be more basically uh 
aware and wary after. The second silver lining, I think, is that governments are inefficient. They are, I mean, the governments, I mean, mass centralized uh, central planning solutions, they lack information yeah. and they lack incentives. Yeah. And that makes them corrupt, but also very, very inefficient. So it's bad that they are corrupt because they become very evil because they don't have any kind of uh, ethical constraint anymore because they're very corrupt. But they are also very, very inefficient. So uh, even if uh, I, can, um, I can think that a company like Zoom is a big company, but is a, mar is a quasi market. I mean, there are some state distortions that makes it, it very powerful, like uh, patent laws and stuff like that. But being a market, a market entity, even if it's very big, uh, it's inside the competition culture. Somebody, I mean, I remember when people were saying Bill Gates that he was a, a super dominant guy, and he said some kids in a garage in a garage can actually compete with me, and everybody was laughing, laughing at him. But that, with Google, that kind of really happened. So there is more um, market powers, market superpowers are more fragile than than state powers, but they're more efficient. So Zoom is probably more evil and more uh, skilled at doing evil, but more fragile. While the, the, the nation states is probably not as well organized as a Zoom company or Google. Like I will, never, I will never trust the government to do anything, including bad stuff at scale. Uh, the Italian government would be terrible into actually uh, using facial recognition data in order to tax me or punish me because they're so inefficient that they cannot do that. And the third and last silver lining is that technology is growing and uh, unless we enter a, a very Roman Empire collapse kind of recession, technology will likely keep growing and technology growing uh, basically helps offensive weapons development, but also defensive weapon developments. For example, uh, deep fakes is very interesting because now we, can, we have facial recognition, but we can basically fuck up fake, fake, uh, facial recognition, putting any kind of politician everywhere in the web. And we do have, of course, like uh, geolocalization, but we can we can mess up a lot with, with, yeah, with yeah. things. I mean, there is technology that can prevent stuff and maybe confuse stuff even more. So we can probably have some tools to counterattack. We have a lot of resistance. <laughs> yeah. This conversation really expanded my my horizon, my consciousness, as usual. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to to your next book. By the way, you know, you, I mean, your thank first you. book it was already a masterpiece, uh, and yeah. and thank you, thank you. your articles are awesome. Um, yeah, love and, your work. Thanks. Yeah, Same. and so yeah, so you know, I just wanted to have like a what do you what do you call it? I don't know, realistic reflection with you guys. Where are we? Where are we going with this? Um, and and uh, what is what is really? I know you know things uh, things evolve out of necessity. You know, human beings go into a human action because of necessity, out of experience. But unfortunately, we don't learn out anything out of history. My history teacher used to say uh, it would be too good to be true if we learned something. But I am convinced that we do learn out of history. Otherwise, we wouldn't evolve. You know. No, that's so, why we're having this conversation right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we cannot learn from anything but history. That's the only, yeah. that's the only empirical evidence we have of anything, right? Yeah. Uh, and we have to learn with what parts of it are distorted and distorted by what and to what extent. But that's the only yeah. thing we have. We, we only have what we have. Oh. We are chained to the arrow of time. Agree. Not a great tool. History is not a great tool, but it's the only tool. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. We have to make it work. Yeah, so yeah, that, like like Darwin. Well, well, why the fuck does this snail uh, look like this? Like the the history is all we got. We yeah. we we can observe even, stuff. Even Darwin we can learned, learned, I think, a lot of about his own <laughs> mistakes. Uh, you know, because I think it was more about competition uh, in Darwin's theory. I mean, I would just maybe generalizing. Uh, but now I think we're going more into cooperation. You know, and and, and yeah. It's sort of a yeah, yeah. multi-spectrum evolution. So uh, to wrap this up, uh, any final thoughts, um, advice? Uh, <laughs> well, um, 
if you want to stay home, stay home, but uh, fire up a BTC Pay server, start to sell uh, goods and services with that, with Bitcoin, stack sets, try to mind your privacy. It's true that it's messed up, but there is no reason to make it even easier to the, to the adversary to, to, get, to get behind you. So uh, it's true, always think that your privacy sucks because it does, but still, uh, still use it, yeah. use the tools that you can use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'd just like to add that I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Just that I knew that I would. Uh, I'm a bit sorry for Kevin that uh, has been like, I mean, me and Giacomo, we've been, we've been talking a lot, but uh, <laughs> no, that's Kevin, on purpose. Yeah. That's why it's called panel discussion. <laughs> uh, okay. I thought listener. it was a three-way panel, but it <laughs> turned out to be a two-way panel. But I, I uh, really enjoy your stuff, and I think you're doing a great deed for for Bitcoin. For Bitcoiners everywhere, and keep keep doing what you're doing. Really appreciate it. You yeah, too, Giacomo. You. But yeah, thanks. All right. Have a good evening, and you too. Yeah. Hope to have you back soon. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. -bye. <laughs>
And the problem I see is that uh, the main problem is that most people cannot even imagine, let alone comprehend, because we all, we, you know, we all been lacking the, the, you know, the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the, the comprehension process, the understanding process. Uh, we can't even imagine what life, existence, cooperation, um, uh, interactive cooperation, uh, society, civilization, technological innovation, um, um, evolution on every level and in every dimension you can think and imagine. Whether it be on a social level, scientific level, technological level, even spiritual level, structural level, we can't even imagine we can have such a prosperous, such an unimaginably prosperous life, uh, not only for ourselves, but for our beloved ones, for our future generations, for our children existing or, or future children or for all the children, for all, for all humanity. And I think this is at the end of the day, we've got to ask ourselves, why Bitcoin? And Bitcoin is in essence, it's, it's in its fundamental essence about freedom. It's about uh, ethos, about f uh, peace, uh, literally, without any kitsch, you know, it's about real peace within freedom and freedom within peace, prosperity, technological innovation by order of magnitude. We can't even imagine. I mean, starting, I mean, have we ever asked ourselves again for the last hundred years, seriously, we're still using, we're still burning fuels, whatever, you know, on whatever, you know, technological innovation level, but it's still combustion engines, you know, it's still jet engines, whatever, but it's, it's burning fuel. So we should maybe, you know, not only electronically computer information systems, we should go into different areas of technology and really evolve, really give it a jump start. And, you know, we have all the people, we have all the genius, creative people, we have scientists, engineers, technologists, uh, we have entrepreneurs, investors, and we would all be blossoming and thriving. And we don't, we, there's no need to reduce the population, whatever Bill Gates and other, you know, uh, 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 elite uh, cult, uh, elite members, uh, you know, have dreamt of and their predecessors from eugenicists, uh, whatever uh, organizations in beginning in the early 20th century. So, you know, the rabbit hole is really deep, but I really implore you, I really beg you, go into the rabbit hole to the different rabbit holes start reading start listening not only to my podcast to many other podcasts whether it be you know john valley's uh, the articles uh, by by Gigi, uh, robert breedlove uh, giacomo zucco um um, um knut svanholm um uh, Safed and Amos with his The Bitcoin Standards, a classical book where about, you know, understanding, you know, the fundamental properties, the essence of what is money? Where does it come from? Why do we need money? What kind of money? So, you know, actually it starts all with um, expanding the horizon and the consciousness and the intelligence of of the very smallest one, the children. This is where, it's, where it starts. This is why I'm so against this conventional compartmentalized schooling system. Because of course, yeah, they, you know, they, they grow up, they, you know, do, uh, make a career out of it or whatever, but it's not really accelerating or opening up their, their creativity, their intelligence. It's, uh, and let alone like giving them the, the, the real possibility to question the narrative, the official, the, the dogma, the narrative, you know, the indoctrination, uh, all these things that are being, you know, shoved down our throat or, um, uh, and what's next, you know, are we going to like, uh, get, uh, I don't know, microchipped, uh, in our ass or, you know, or micro nanoparticle, um, certificates under our skin. Maybe we don't even need that probably. Maybe technology is already so advanced. We don't even need an, a, a vaccine or injection. Maybe it's already in the air. Who knows, you know, uh, because when we talk about nanoparticles, like, uh, and the, the technology that is just on the surface visible, but uh, within the military industrial complex or whatever it is, uh, I know I'm going a little bit off the tangent here, but uh, it's really important to to sometimes zoom out, zoom in, and understand the bigger, much, much bigger picture, and uh, understand the process, and uh, uh, and really ask ourselves why we're we doing this, why Bitcoin. Uh, why, why do we need technological innovation? Why do we need, uh, uh, you know, open-minded education and creativity 
um, because that's the only way to go. You know, we need to ask uh, our own uh, behavioral patterns, our mindset patterns, our our cultural patterns. You know, just because it's a tradition doesn't mean a tradition is good. You know, the same thing with religion. Just because a religion, you know, I'm you know, everybody can believe in whatever. You know, so I'm I'm I, I trust in in the in the ethos of peace, of love, of science, of technology, of you know, of equal equal opportunities of equal, you know, um, paths, uh, to open up and to, you know, uh, so we can evolve, you know, not only individually, but, but as a, as a, as a community, as a family, as a, as a society, as a civilization, it's really time it's overdue. It's the year 2020 and with everything you, I mean, just think about it with everything that's going on right now, uh, whatever the virus is out there sure take it seriously you know maybe it's a super serious flu or whatever virus contagious whatever it is maybe we're totally being lied to manipulated uh and and uh you know um uh, whatever there's so much scientific uh and fraud going on you know the scientific medical establishment the academics the pharmaceuticals behind it, uh, with WHO, CDC, the foreign organizations, Fauci, you know, being on the board of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. These are like little, little small details. Once you like put them together and then zoom back, uh, and really like ask ourselves, uh, do we really need this? You know, why, what do we want? What do we wish for ourselves and for our children and for our family, for our beloved ones, for our future generations? What do we really wish, you know? Why can't we start enjoying, you know, a prosperous, uh, a freedom blossoming life, uh, you know, within ethos of, of, of love, of, of peace, of technological innovation, of scientific innovation by order of magnitude. And this is where, why, why I trust, not only believe, but I trust in the power and the essence of the, in the fundamental properties, in the, in the fundamental future and vision of, of Bitcoin. Um, and it's, you know, it's all of us that's, uh, eventually necessary for that, you know, whether it's a critical mass or the total humanity, but it, it needs an initiative action. It needs a human action. You need to go, we all need to go into human action, reflect upon ourselves and ask ourselves, why are we doing this? What do we need to do? You know, take self-responsibility, self-sovereignty and yeah, and thrive in, in freedom and in, um, in joy and pleasure. That's what life is about. All right. Thank you so much for watching, for listening. Thanks so much for support. Please subscribe, follow me, whatever you do, uh, follow Knut Svalholm and Joko Mazuka on Twitter. I'm going to put those in the show notes. Um, uh, it would do me a favor if you write a positive review or, you know, uh, reshare it, retweet it with your friends, neighbors, family, whatever you do, but, uh, Get, get the information out there uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we all need to give. And the more we give, the more we, we, we love and share, you know, our, from, from within our intelligence, our, our comprehension, our knowledge, the more we receive back. And uh, I think this is the infinity loop that we, we, uh, that we, we can and we should um, accelerate, speed up the process of, uh, of uh, evolution. Um, in every dimension we can imagine. All right. My name is Kevin Avani, uh, the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show and the Total Connector Show. Thank you so much and have a good evening. It stays healthy and stay safe. Mm -hmm.